Well, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, we had a memorial service here yesterday for Joshua Jackson, and the Lord ministered deeply to our hearts, and, and John and Kim were just a, a beautiful testimony of grace. Uh, one of our members, Lisa Murillo, uh, you know Miguel, Miguel and Lisa, uh, she had a major heart attack on Friday night, and Mike has asked prayers for her healing. Uh, the Lord preserved her life, and, and she is healing up well. They'll be doing tests to see how much damage was done to that heart, but if you would lift that family up and reach out to them. This morning, we're going to continue our study in the book of Romans. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 8, I want to read our section of scripture and then play, pray, and just let's ask God's blessing upon our, our study in his word. So if you'll look with me in verse 31. <clears throat> What then shall we say to these things, the most amazing things ever, that God foreknew you, he predestined you, he called you, he justified you, and he is certainly going to glorify you? What do you say to things like that? Well, if God is for us, who's against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies who is the one who condemns? <clears throat> Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God and who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, nor COVID, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. These are the five unanswerable questions. One preacher said, it's as if Paul now is daring the entire universe to stand against the purposes of God. And the answer to all five questions is nobody, no one. No one can come against these things. And so let us pray as we stand in grace. Father, we understand in a mirror dimly, we comprehend so little. What we just read should bring all the saints to our faces. God, the gift to have your favor put upon us as one that we just keep plumbing the depths and looking from every angle at the blessing that comes from the children of God, from their God. Lord, thank you for this gospel. And thank you for so great a salvation. God, minister to your people this morning through this fourth question. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week uh, we had a prolonged introduction trying to show you the way that God uses the doctrines of justification and glorification, that when you believe you're justified, you're declared not guilty, and glorification is when you finally get to glory and you're made perfect in the presence of God. And we were looking at how those two doctrines are, are designed by God to make us holy men, women, and children. They're, they're, they're sanctifying when you live into them and understand them. Uh, we, we said through Romans 6, the only sin you can ever overcome is forgiven sin, justification. And as we hope in glory and its absolute certainty, it empowers us not to live for this world. I don't have to grab the gusto. I don't have to get the things of this life, the, the seen. I live for the unseen God and my eternal future that's certain that is going to come to me. And so this sets us apart as different people, aliens that don't belong here, longing for another world. And this week, I want to come now, that was very broad, and this week we're going to narrow down to our current context, and I want to make sure you don't miss what Paul is doing. Why these five questions? They're very repetitive. I'm sorry, these, these kind of things keep me up at night. It's amazing. Why, Paul? We can look at each one and we can worship and praise God forever on each question. Each one deserves a full sermon. 
I guess I've given each one a full sermon. I'm sorry. <laughs> but why is he throwing out these five questions in the universe, putting a battery on his shoulder? I dare you to knock it off. What is Paul after? What does he want us to get from these five questions? And so I just want to come back into our, our immediate context to make sure no one in this church misses this. <clears throat> Romans 8, 17. So I, I have a sinus infection that's been going on for a month. Where's James Drake? Do not get nervous. I'm about as healthy as I've ever been right now with COVID or a cold. I've had every one of them, so this cough is from a sinus infection. I wouldn't even come near you uh, with sickness. Verse 17. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You get inheritance if we suffer with him so that we might also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time that we live in right now are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us and in us. <clears throat> he tells us in that section, the world was subjected to futility when Adam sinned. And now we live in this broken world that makes no sense and it's just decaying and falling apart because it's come out from under God. And we see that there's difficulty and the design is that we might hope for this coming kingdom, this culmination of all things. And so that you won't make Denver paradise, but you keep looking for what is to come. That's the design, that we, we'd be set apart and be those who hope in the midst of futility and brokenness in this world. You're just these little diamonds that don't make sense because you're filled with hope in a hopeless world if you take God out of it. <clears throat> we see in verses 26 through 27, God gives us the Holy Spirit within and he intercedes because in this journey of futility and trials and hardships, we don't always know how, how to pray. We're confused, we're stumped, and the Spirit is interceding perfectly according to the will of God so that you keep persevering and growing and get through what's going on in your life. The, you have God praying for you. He gets it right every time. He's going to get you to glory. And then we get the beautiful diamond of verse 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So, God, in, in all this fallenness and futility and trials and tribulations, he's going to work everything for your good. And what is that purpose? What is that good? In verses 29 through 30, it's that he's going to bring you to glory. He's going to bring you to perfection, to dwell with him forever. So what is, what is he after? Romans 8, 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? This side of glory, guys, tribulation will come upon you. Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. You're going to have all kinds of things come against you in this fallen, broken world. There are those who are against you and want to destroy you. There are times when you, you feel like God is, is not going to get you through this. He, uh, Romans 8, 32, if he didn't spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also freely give you all things that you need to get to glory? He did the hard thing. He, he didn't spare his son. He's going to give you everything you need in these trials and tribulations and squeezings and difficulties and futility to get to glory. He's going to help you when the charges come against you from your own conscience even. Not guilty, not guilty in this morning condemnations that are going to be thrown against you. And that I could be separated from his love. I have humans who, who quit loving me and stop. I need a God who will never quit loving me. And so you're going to enter into all this trial, tribulation, difficulty. This is what Paul is after. It's going to get really hard on your way to glory. I promise, God promises you. It is a hard path to glory. All hell is set against you. You got a real devil, a real world that's against God drawing you in, and you have a real flesh that is remaining that, that wants everything other than God. These are not make believe. Am I preaching to the right group? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Give that little kid some candy. That was beautiful. Yeah. 
So your pastor isn't crazy, is he? He gets all fired up. <laughs> but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And I pray that doesn't go by lightly. And all these things that are going to come against you that we've been studying and looking at and learning, we, we, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We don't just escape hard times and grit our teeth. We're conquerors. We triumph through this gospel of Jesus Christ. God has more for us than just gritting our teeth. And I, I am watching 2022 is the year of gritting your teeth. There's something better. There's so much depression over the world and the, the church right now. What do we do? Well, we learn Romans 8, 31 through 39. We memorize the words. We have fighter verses that we've been memorizing. And Gianna reminded me we're overdue for the pizza party for all the kids who memorized it. So we're going to get that set up. Thank Mrs. Pine. Give her a hug, kids. We logic and we argue with them against our enemies and our circumstances. You've got things coming against you and your own thoughts, your own battles. What do you do? I gotta take these truths that we're learning and I gotta think through them and logic them and get them into my mind and my heart and all the different circumstances. Don't let them preach to us. They preach guilty. You're guilty, you're, you're condemned. God doesn't love you. Look at your circumstances. They're preaching at you, telling you that. John Jackson, what did we do at the funeral for your son yesterday, brother? We looked at the scene and we fought the fight of faith, didn't we? Amen. We fought all the accusations that come against you. Those without this, at that funeral, were guilty. And wrestling with, how, what could I have done? How could I have helped him more, Joshua? What could I have done? And John stood up at his own son's funeral and he lifted up the name of Jesus Christ and he showed everything that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Christ Jesus, I had goosebumps. This isn't to fill up your notebooks. To see if you'll hear something this morning you've never heard about this passage. Guys, this is going to matter when you're laying in a hospital bed with a ventilator and those heart machines beeping and the enemy says look at your life you're guilty you're condemned you're miserable right now there's no way that God loves you what are you going to do this isn't just playing games this is eternal and for real what are you going to do when your bank account's empty and you got no job and the devil's yelling God doesn't care about you you haven't been able to come to church for a year because of your health. God's punishing you is what he'll tell you. I can't tell you enough how much this matters. And we got to be a people who can fight the fight of faith. Stand up as Paul and answer these arguments with confidence that nothing can thwart the will of our God to bring us to glory, to conform us to his son. And this is so important to me as one of your pastors. I spent many years not knowing how to fight the accusers when they would come when I was first saved. I didn't know. And I would try to argue. I'm not that bad. <laughs> I'm trying. I go to church every Sunday. You know what that did for me? <laughs> Nothing. I didn't know how to fight. So I lived in fear that someone was going to come against me. I lived in guilt with all the charges that were being brought in my conscience. I lived in self-condemnation and had a hard time believing there was a God who could really love me. Praise be to God for discipleship, teaching, preaching, reading, the secret place where I have ironed out these truths and seeking to fight now in the way I'm going to preach to you this morning. Some of you are just drowning and you're not getting this. And may today be the lifter of your heads and learn the gospel and how to fight with it and fight for it for your joy. Okay, that was for free. That was shorter than last week. <laughs> By a minute. That is why Paul is throwing out these five questions. I want you to hear this. So that you will look at your security 
and you'll suffer well. Like, you've got to get this so ironed out. God loves me, and he saved me, and he's going to bring me to glory, and nothing can thwart it. And when you have that, Paul says, here, you're going to suffer well. And these present sufferings can't compare to what's coming. And so we've got to get this. We've got to iron this out in our own mind and hearts. And I want you to hear this. These five questions are the right of every Christian believer to have this bold assurance. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So I, I want you to see this isn't for the great saints like Paul. This is for you, brother and sister in Christ. You can have this kind of audacity that Paul has in these five questions. This is what I'm praying for, for a whole church that can stand up and have this kind of confidence and assurance and what's going on in our world and what's coming upon us. We've got to be those who fight the fight of faith. And as I look, this is the last thing, and we'll start. I, I see a whole country over the last decades, when they studied eternal security, it was so that we can kick back and live the American dream and never doubt. We're going to go to heaven when we're done. We can live easy, comfortable lives, sin. They, they took eternal security and quit fighting. It was just... It was just abused and misused. That's not eternal security. I'm going to show you that it's the opposite of what eternal security does for the believer. It makes you want to live holy to your God with this little short span called life. You get, you get what we're looking at, and all that comes out is, I want to live for this God every second, every day. It empowers me, and it strengthens me. It doesn't cause me to want to sin and just say, oh, I got eternal security. You've missed all of Romans if that's where you've landed. Father, I pray now as we open up this fourth question, please come and meet us and teach us how to fight the fight of faith. God, change lives this morning. Change, change battle plans. Transform and set people free from a life of receiving accusations and condemnation and living into it. God, give them, equip them this morning to stand up against such enemies. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. First question, if God is for us, who could ever be against us in any way that could harm us from God's purpose and will in our life? And we learn that there are all kinds of people against us. They just can't do anything to hurt us from what God is doing in our lives. The second question, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how will he not freely give us all things that we need on our way to glory? And the third question last week is who can bring a charge against God's elect? And it's God who justifies. He's already declared you not guilty. Uh, you can't go to a higher court. You can't have anything new brought in. When God justified you, he knew everything about you. And you are declared not guilty before God. Fourth question. This is just going to be an easy sermon. It's just the whole work of Christ in one verse. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, just rather who was raised and is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. So last week we learned who can bring an accusation against God's elect. And now we come to the sentencing stage is who, who can condemn us? And the answer is the same as every question, no one. The case is closed. The sentence has been pronounced by the judge of the universe. You are not guilty. But just like the first three questions, yeah, there are a lot of people and fallen angels are against me in verse 31. Many are trying to harm me. And yes, many are accusing me. My conscience, the law, people, the devil, all these accusations are coming from inside and without. And now who can condemn me? And the answer is many. Many people can condemn you on a daily basis. My, my whole life has been condemnations. You grow up with Seven boys in one house, and you know what you get? Put downs, beat up, kicked around, told it as the little guy, nothing. Tim, you know the, the drill. You and I lived it. <laughs> Six and seven, man, a lot of fun. Your whole life is condemnation. But I think the most constant kind of condemnation that we battle is self-condemnation. And we battle, again, feeling like bums and, and losers. 
And we live in an era where there's just success at any cost, and that's how they define uh, people and their identity. And I, I look at me and my life and all my accomplishments and the things I wanted to do and didn't, and I just, I live under condemnation. I live under self condemnation. And I think the worst can be spiritually, where you just live under a spiritual condemnation. My worship was just so far from where it should have been this morning. I had a chance to share the gospel this week, and I kept silent. There's something I did in the past I just can't forgive myself for. It sits on me, and I live in the condemnation every day. I'm not as sold out as I should be. I don't trust God the way I should. I just live with an echo, condemned, condemned, condemned. And you're Christians, and you're walking around with condemnation, and you, you feed it, and you believe it, and you play with it. I kind of find two groups since I've been a pastor. There are those who just hardly ever feel guilt or condemnation, you, you, and there's nothing wrong with the, the way you're wired. You just walk around, and, and that isn't the, the, the weakness. And then there's, there's others that that's all you feel. <laughs> I just hear it and feel it all day. I remember this interview I was listening to with John Piper and John MacArthur. If you haven't heard those names, just two famous preachers. And they said, how do you battle depression? And, and John Piper's like, I wake up every Monday wondering if I'm a Christian. And the battle begins again, and he's just sharing his deep, deep battle with depression on a constant basis. And John MacArthur just goes, I, I, I don't battle it. How, how can you be depressed when you're married to my wife? <laughs> I'm looking at both these people going, there's differences in the body of Christ. The battle that I see is how do I live with Romans 7 with this indwelling, remaining sin that fights against me as a child of God and the voice of Satan that you're condemned. And, and, and there, there's this battle that we're going to have to learn because if you got remaining sin, when, you, when you're condemned, it, it, remaining sin is, yeah, I, I, I do come short. I am a sinner. There, there's just this constant battle that's going to be waged, and that's what we're stepping into this morning. And for some of you, it's just, how you doing? Well, good under the circumstances. I'm doing so bad as a Christian, I just am falling short. And condemnation just starts oozing. And it comes out because you live in it all day long. And what I am praying for this morning is I want that to change. Some are so plagued by this. I'm just praying that it would get lifted this morning. To give you a way to fight this with God's thoughts and his truth and his ways. This is not how God wants you to live the Christian life. It's not humility. It can become navel-gazing with an undue focus on ourselves. And we can get so focused that it just, we, we live in the condemnation. And, and, and we got to, you know, that, that saying, for every look at sin, take 10 at the cross. That's what we're going to look at this morning. And so the question I want you to hear is, who can condemn you this morning and it really stick. Who can bring you back under the condemnation of God is the question. And in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore right now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the answer is, can anyone condemn you in such a way that it brings you back under God's condemnation? Can that ever happen? Did you know that when you believed in Jesus Christ and were saved, you can never, ever come back under the condemnation of God ever again. There, there's certain things that are impossible. And one is to come back under God's condemnation. It, it would actually be impossible. It can't happen. The sword is no longer over your head. It went through his son's side. I just walk around smiling. <laughs> the world's condemning me everywhere. My heart's condemning me. My kids condemn me. No one can ever bring you back under God's condemnation. This morning, what Paul wants you to do is live in freedom. Don't live under all the condemnation and guilt and charges from last week. Don't live that way. The gospel has been designed to set you free where you can live in freedom. I'm loved by God. No charges, 
No condemnation, free. I can't come back under it. Thank you, Lord. So let's look at the answer for how we're to think about these condemnations that come at us on a daily basis. How do I handle them? How do I deal with them truthfully? And the answer is not, yeah, I'm condemned, you're right. Don't, don't just keep playing along. Yeah, I'm a louse, I'm condemned, I don't deserve anything. Don't feed it, don't agree with it. Too many have never preached against these things. I know Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about preaching against depression. I'm talking about preaching against condemnation, preaching against guilt. Because you, you get it all day long, accusing your own conscience. So you, what do you do? i got to preach against it. And Paul's teaching us right here how to do that. you got to stand up to these accusations and these condemnations and these fears and quit just living in them. No, you can't, you can't charge me. You can't condemn me and say, uh-uh. Give them answers like this. God's for me. All the fears of everyone coming against me, I don't have to live in that fear. God is for me. Nothing can hurt me ultimately. How about he gave his own son for me? How's he going to forget me now? How about he justified me? No one can bring up a new charge that God didn't know when he said not guilty. No one. How about God already condemned his own son in my place? That's how you fight. And so my question to you this morning is, do you do this? If not, you're losing. I'll guarantee it. Because I did it. I know it experientially. This is the devil's tactic to keep you down and unfruitful for the kingdom of God. If he can just get you navel-gazing, sitting under condemnation, living in guilt, you'll just be defeated and quiet, and you'll close your mouth, and your life will, be, it will not bear fruit. That's what he's trying to do to the believers. To just live in these lies that are being thrown at you all day long. So last week, we made a huge observation. And the answer, uh, if you look back in verse 33, who brings a charge against God's elect? And the answer was not just, hey, you're justified. And that would have been a good answer. But it's that God is the one who justifies and Paul wanted to drive home that it's, it's God himself, no higher court, who justifies you. And now look at the question this morning in verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Who condemns? And the answer could have been, Jesus died. He was raised, ascended, intercedes. But, but I want you to notice how Paul answers it. His answer is, Christ Jesus is he who died. And you'll notice in all four of these points this morning, in verse 34, the focus is not on the action, but on the person who did it. So please listen. This is not an impersonal Christ who came and did these things. This is so important. It's not a doctrine that you memorize. Study, get it right. This is a person who did this for you our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our head, our friend, our brother, our shepherd, our guide, our surety. This whole Bible reveals a person, and this person whom I don't see, I love him. And I want you to hear this this morning. This one died on your behalf. This person was buried on your behalf. And this friend was raised, and this bridegroom intercedes on your behalf this very morning. How many miss this? Don't settle for doctrines and facts. Jesus said, coming to him as to a living stone. Come to me, all who are weary with accusations and condemnations. Come to me, the glory of the church, Christ, the personal Savior. Look at this one and what he did for you. Don't leave this impersonal or external. It's a big mistake that people do all over the country. Take this into your heart. This one, the Christ, my Lord and my God, that one died for me. The glory of the passage last week was, what the, was that the Father has justified us 
And this week, it's that Jesus, our personal Savior, this one, has died for us. Last week, that a father could look at his own son and not spare him, but pierce him through. And this week, that the Son of God could go up on a cross willfully on our behalf. And so what this means to me is that we're moving into the sentencing, and it's in a courtroom. And I want, I want, I, I'm going to walk up to the judge's bench with my head hung low for all my crimes. And as I'm standing there, I look up at the bench and I, I see the judge. And it's Jesus. All judgment has been given over to him. He's the judge of all men. And our case is with that one who died for me and was raised in a seat at the right hand and is making intercession for me right now. That one. That Jesus is my judge. Hallelujah, what a savior. All right, let's go to battle. This morning, here's your outline. I'm not going to call that introduction. That was setting the context. (laughs) This morning, Paul's going to give us four pillars to silence all claims on the believer that he's under condemnation. So here's now how we battle. Who's the one who condemns? First pillar, I got to fight for this. I'm being condemned. I deserve God's wrath. I deserve, I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. Christ Jesus is he who died. We spent a considerable time in Romans 3 at the cross. Jesus went up on a cross. He died in our place. He made atonement, at one minute, to bring you back to God. He, he, in verse 25 of Romans 3, he propitiated the wrath of God, which we deserved, all of, all of the wrath for our sins. He drained the cup. And Jesus had no sin of his own to atone for, so it's vicarious. He did it for us on our behalf. There's no other reason for the perfect son of God hanging on a tree than if it was a substitution, doing it in our place. Carl Barth was asked, what was the most important word in the Bible? What would you say? His answer was interesting. He said, huper. It's a Greek preposition that means on behalf of or in place of. And this signifies that the death of Jesus was in our place on behalf of us. He received massive condemnation so that we might not have to. Back to Romans 8, 3. One day we're going to stand before this God. And when you stand before him, his glory is going to make the sun look like a candle. And his wrath will absolutely consume sin. And on that day, the word hooper will get its rightful place. When he say he stood in that on behalf of me. This one bore sin in my place, the wrath of God. And so my question this morning, whoever could condemn you then? Because God condemned his son on a cross for your sin. All of your sin was condemned on that cross. So all the cries, you're a louse, you're a coveter, you're a thief, you're a luster, your faith is so weak. The answer is Christ Jesus is he who died. That was a beautiful answer. Go beneath the bloody tree of Calvary and shelter yourself there. That is the safest place we could be. It shuts the mouth of all your accusers. It's accuse, accuse, accuse. Christ Jesus is the one who died for every accusation you're bringing against me. Spafford said, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought that my sin not in part but the whole has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Second pillar, when condemnation comes against you, yes, rather who was raised. Yes, rather as if the resurrection adds something more to his death. We generally receive more comfort from the cross than an empty tomb. And so does the resurrection add anything to the atoning work of Jesus on the cross? And we hear these people today say, it doesn't matter if you believe in a literal resurrection or not. If you do not believe this, you're still dead in your sins, said Paul. If there's no resurrection, we're among all men to be most pitied. Our preaching is in vain. We have no hope. What's the connection? 
Romans 4.25, we studied it a year ago. He who was delivered up, Jesus, because of our transgressions and was buried and he was raised because of our justification. So here, this resurrection is not the cause of our justification. It's the proof that we have been justified by the death of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And that resurrection is the Father saying, he's the way, the truth, and the life. You can come to me through this work of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was alive, he said, I got to die and I got to make a ransom for many. And he died and he was put in a sepulcher. And the question is, did he do what he said? Was he a ransom for many? Did he save his people from their sins? His words alone do not prove that his death was an atonement. What if he sinned one time? If I'm going to bank my whole life and eternity on this, I need something big to tell me that his death truly was for my sin and in my place and removed it. The morning of the resurrection comes and the women come to the tomb and the stone has been rolled away. And he said, he has risen just as he said. And right there, the father has verified his claims. The father has said, yes, it is finished. There is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. R.A. Torrey said, I look at the cross of Christ and I know that atonement has been made for my sins. I look at the open sepulcher and the risen and ascended Lord, and I know that the atonement has been accepted. There no longer remains a single sin on me, no matter how many or how great my sins may have been. My sins may have been as high as the mountains, but in the light of the resurrection, the atonement that covers them is as high as heaven. My sins may have been as deep as the ocean, but in the light of the resurrection, the atonement that swallows them up is as deep as as eternity. The resurrection just preaches they have been removed as far as the east is from the west. Who can condemn you? Christ died. And he's been raised. The Father raised him so I can be absolutely certain there's no charges, no condemnation for Ken Murphy. The resurrection is the public acknowledgement the debt has been paid. And now there's no record left of your sin been buried in the tomb. And when he was raised, now the first fruit will soon follow. So who can condemn you? Sin, law, devil, death, hell. It was all answered in the death and resurrection. Third pillar. Who can condemn you? He's now at the right hand of God. Christ wasn't just raised. He was raised up into heaven and he's seated right now at the right hand of God. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. John 17, 4, he said, Father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do, and now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, right at the right hand of the Father. And here he is glorified for what he has done. He's redeemed the ransomed church of God, and he has been exalted above every name. And one, one thing that jumped out at me is he's seated. Consider Jesus, his earthly work. He had little time to eat or sleep. He was so intent on accomplishing his work. And now it says he sits because that work is finished. It's all just preaching. The high priest would stand daily ministering and offering sacrifices for sin. I can't remember who said it, but he said there were no seats in the tabernacle. Go back and look at the design. There wasn't one chair. <laughs> You don't sit. You don't sit. Hebrews 10, 11, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from this time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he's perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Who can bring a condemnation? Jesus is seated because the work is finished. One time sacrifice, done, finished. And he was raised into the holiest of holies. And he brought his own blood for the sins of his people to make atonement. He sat down. It's finished. 
to, to seat him at God the Father's right hand. It's done. God is satisfied or he would have never be seated at his right hand. Guys, it's finished. He was raised to the highest place now to promote what he purchased, to oversee the salvation of his own, to protect his bride, to make it holy, and to bring it to glory. Jesus is seated. So who can condemn you? Christ Jesus died for everything, all your sin. He was raised, the Father said, sufficient. He's seated at the right hand of God because it's completed. And now your fourth pillar who also intercedes for us. What does he do in the highest place? He's not asking for condemnation. He's praying for us on our behalf. I was thinking of Pharaoh's cup bearer. <laughs> he gets promoted and what did he do? Joseph who? <laughs> he forgot Joseph. We have a greater Joseph. Uh, Jesus, he doesn't forget us. He's seated at the right hand of God. He has us in his heart. He didn't get up there and forget you. He's interceding for you. He's praying on behalf of his bride. A high priest ordained for the people, praying for the people of God. Christ is our high priest. He would lose none of his sheep. He said, I will raise them up. And he prays that we will persevere and make it to the end. Christ prays to the Father on our behalf. So I love it. you got the Holy Spirit within your heart and soul praying to God for your protection and his purposes to be accomplished. Jesus Christ in heaven praying for you for the purposes that you will make it to glorification. What can separate you from God? Nothing. He intercedes against everything that's trying to bring you back into condemnation. Just smile. What can get you? Hold up everything in your heart right now that's making you feel condemnation. Providences, sin, enemies, trials, nothing can bring you back under condemnation. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You know why your faith didn't fail this week? Because he's interceding for you at the right hand of God. You know why it won't fail next week? Because he's at the right hand of God interceding for you. You are so safe. We just keep looking at it from every angle. Do you need another angle? Just, you've, we've done a 360 of all of eternity. Nothing can harm you or bring you back under condemnation, bring you under God's wrath. My goodness, we have everything in Christ. So as I look at my life, that's why my faith has not failed. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what onslaughts the enemy plans for me. I just know there's going to be many. And I would just walk right into them like a sheep led to the slaughter. I'm a knucklehead. Except Christ prays for me, and his prayer is always effectual. And one of my favorites who walked this earth was John Bunyan. I want to quote what he said about this. To be saved and brought to glory, to be carried through this dangerous world with my first moving after Christ till I set my foot within the gates of paradise, glory. This is the work of my mediator, Jesus, of my high priest and my intercessor. It's he that fetches us again when we run away. It's he that lifts us up when the devil and sin has thrown us down. It's he that quickens us when we grow cold. It's he that comforts us when we despair. It's he that obtains fresh pardon when we've contracted sin. And he that purges our consciences when they're loaded with guilt. Listen to Hebrews 7.23. And the former priest on the one hand under the old covenant existed in greater numbers. We had to have a bunch of them because they were prevented by death from continuing. Those priests kept dying. But he, Jesus, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. He doesn't die. Hence, also then, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. <laughs> he's able to save you forever because he's interceding for you as a high priest. That's the grace of God. One last quote, and we'll close. 
John Murray says, nothing serves to verify the intimacy and constancy of the Redeemer's preoccupation with the security of his people. Nothing assures us of his unchanging love more than the tenderness which his heavenly priesthood he speaks as it comes into expression in his intercession for us. What love that Christ is interceding and praying for us in heaven. We get the opposite of condemnation. That's what's been hitting me. It's not just the absence of condemnation. The presence of the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. It's just we, we have everything for life and godliness. He's able to save us forever. It just, we, we, just, we have his favor, his love. We have no more wrath and anger. And this gospel is just, God is for us. God is for us. There's no need that you can possibly have to which the Lord Jesus is indifferent. No problem that you will have that he'll ever turn a deaf ear to. So my question this morning is who can condemn us? Jesus Christ is he who died. Yet rather who was raised. He's at the right hand of God seated. Who intercedes for us who bear on our behalf praying for us. What God has given us to fight the fight of faith, pray, fight this fight. And may he lift your burdens and give you inexpressible joy and power to live for this God till you breathe your last. Let's pray. Father, these words are infinite. I came so short. I, I repent before you. God, I pray, just let us by your spirit and these words get just a little glimmer of what's available for us in Christ. God, let the people of God learn how to fight the fight of faith. Teach us. Let these things that we've been looking at go deep in our minds and get into our hearts, our affections, and our, our will. God, help us to know these condemnations that we've just agreed with and nodded our heads and have lived so defeated by letting them just be at home in our own mind and hearts. Treat them like a family member. God, let them be thrown out this morning. Cast out lies and accusations and condemnations from the children of God. Let them, let them pull out the gospel and look at Jesus who died and was buried and raised and seated at your right hand interceding for them. God, let that replace the lies that have been just held and petted for years. God, bring freedom to the children of God through this glorious gospel. Help us now to be a community that teaches each other how to fight the lies that get thrown at us and messages of condemnation and quit and a God who doesn't love them. Lord, help us to be a community that fights together the fight of faith until one day we enter into the celestial city and behold you with no more enemies and no more battles or fights for all of eternity. God, thank you for the prospect that is certain for every child of God here this morning. Lord, let it make us holy as we hope and purify ourselves in this hope. God, it's in Jesus' name that we do pray.